Now, the other system that we have is much more recently evolved. It's the autopilot system is more associated with the amygdala, the older part of the mind. The other part is really more what makes us human. It's what differentiates us from the monkeys. It's the logical reasoning system. It's called the intentional system. So awesome. the intentional system, it is the one that is much slower. It's much harder to use. It takes effort. It takes willpower. So when you feel yourself trying to restrain yourself from taking that third chocolate chip cookie, that is the intentional system trying to restrain, trying to change and steer in the right direction your autopilot system. So the intentional system is the system that we use for more abstract logical reasoning when we can determine what our long-term goals are. In the autopilot system is not long-term oriented, it's very in the moment. The intentional system is long-term oriented. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I am super fired up today to have Dr. Gleb Sapersky with me today. Uh, Dr. Gleb, I want to start off by just saying thanks for spending the time with me today. And thank you so much for inviting me, Nick. It's a pleasure. Of course. Yeah. So like I just told you, I just finished your book this morning. So I'm super excited to dive into a lot of that. But Dr. Super, Dr. Sapersky is the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts. Um, your background is as a cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist. Um, you're a best-selling author. And as I mentioned, your latest book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. I know you're um, super excited about the book coming out and spreading the word about it. Um, and, I'm ex- and I'm excited as well. Um, but before we dive into the specifics of the book, I kind of want to start off with a little bit of your background because I learned that you were born in Moldova, which is a small country in Eastern Europe. And then I kind of want you to talk about, first off, I'm not exactly sure when you moved to the U.S. I learned that you moved to New York. Um, so I kind of want to talk, talk about when you moved and what were maybe the biggest challenges early on in your early days here in the, in the States. So my parents came to the United States when I was 10 in 1991. I was born in 81. And I grew up in a small country called Moldova in Eastern Europe until 1991 when the Soviet Union was fortunately from me falling apart of, you know, a lot of people there may not like it, but I'm very glad that my parents left the country of Moldova and came here to the United States. You know, didn't have much of a say in it when I was 10, but I'm really glad that they did. An interesting fact is that Moldova is actually one of the least happy countries in the world. When you look at the statistics on this question, I, I was very surprised. And I didn't know what that's about because I wasn't there when yeah. you know, I was a kid. But apparently, very unhappy country, much less happy than the countries around. It's about as happy as war-torn, war-torn Rwanda. So that was wow. not good. <laughs> so that was like a, something interesting to find out. But yeah, I came here to the United States and you know, settling in was kind of hard. I mean, my parents were poor as all immigrants are. So, you know, my mom washed people's houses for a living. You know, my dad drove a bread truck. So at least we always had bread that was nice, you know, bread that fell off the back of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, a, a positive aspect of uh, that part of my life. But yeah, it was really hard to adapt as immigrants. I mean, as you can probably hear, I have an accent. So a lot of people, when they were young, chose to drop and immigrants who came when they were my age, kids, chose to drop their accents. Now, my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage, so I decided to not drop my accent and keep my accent. Unfortunately, you know, going into some of the stuff that I talked about in the book, that I found out later it was kind of a dumb decision if I wanted people to trust me because of a phenomenon called accent discrimination, where people in the United States trust those who have a foreign accent less than they trust those who have a mainstream American accent. So you're hearing me right now and you might be trusting me less without realizing it, at least if you're an American, right? (laughs) because of this phenomenon called accent discrimination. That has to do with some of the stuff that I talk about in the book, the dangerous judgment errors that we all tend to make but that we don't know we're making. Yeah. And this is called this specific uh, cognitive bias dangerous judgment error is called the horns effect, where if we don't like one aspect of someone, like their accent or their background or how they appear, their politics, their religious beliefs, whatever, their sexuality, we will not like all other aspects of that person, regardless of whether we should or shouldn't, regardless of whether that person is good in other ways or not. So it will just cause us to dislike that person. That's very unfortunate, but that's the way it is. I mean, here I'm 
of bit located in Columbus, Ohio. So I taught as a professor for seven years at Ohio State University. So go Bucks. I was just mm -hmm. talking to Nick about this before the podcast. And an interesting uh, thing is that I presented in 2018 to at the local HR conference here in Columbus, Ohio. So from HR professionals from the central Ohio area on diversity and inclusion. The conference was on diversity and inclusion. And so I was doing the closing keynote. And as part of the closing keynote, I asked them, well, so the context is that Ohio State, our big football team, you know, that's our pride and joy, the Ohio State Buckeyes. Now, our big rival is the University of Michigan Wolverines, so up north. And we have a very big rivalry with them. So I asked these HR professionals, the diversity inclusion of these HR leaders in the diversity inclusion conference, about 100 people, how many of you would hire a Michigan fan? So University of Michigan fan. And only three of them <laughs> said that they indicated that they would hire a University of Michigan fan. That's three people, three people at a diversity inclusion conference. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, of course, you know, being a Michigan fan or an Ohio State fan has nothing to do with your performance in the job, but they still wouldn't hire a Michigan fan. Yeah. So it just indicative, shows you the kind of impact that this horns effect can have on us and the dangerous judgment errors that cause us to make really terrible decisions in many areas of life. Yeah. So, like you said, you moved here at 10 and I, I learned that you kind of thought you wanted to pursue a career in the medical field for a long time. And it, it seems like to me, kind of you going down that path a lot of the, for such a long period of time. And I think in your own words and something that I read, you feel like you wasted so much time going down that path because you felt like you were following your gut. I feel like that's probably a big reason as to why you kind of started to diving in, diving into like the neuroscientist feel, field. So I guess I want to, the question I want to ask here is at what point did you realize that you wanted to switch going down the path of your medical career towards this other field? Yeah. So my parents have always taught, told me that, you know, I should do something like become a doctor or lawyer, a good high paying profession. And so doctor was more natural to me than a lawyer. And so I just followed that. There is and there is a number of dangerous judgment errors that cause you to conform kind of this in-group bias where you conform to the people who you perceive to be part of your tribe, that's authority bias where people in a position of authority, you listen to them even though you often should not listen to them, even though it may not be good for you to listen to them. So I fell into that dangerous judgment error when I was young. I didn't know, you know all of this decision-making, the stuff that I know now. So I was going in to go into the medical field, become a doctor. And my application was well in its way. It was in the last year of college when I was starting to rethink this. And I mean, it, it, many people have trouble getting into medical school. I didn't. So I was you know, pretty good. I was just on track. And then there was this one medical school essay that asked, had me write about why I want to be a medical doctor. And that sort of reflective process is what caused me to think about this? Well, hey, why do I want to be a medical doctor? Well, my parents want me to be a medical doctor. And a lot of my friends want me to be a medical doctor. And uh, so that was the things. And then, of course, the status and the prestige was also you know, nice and the money was nice. But it really what didn't pull, it wouldn't be really fulfilling or meaningful for me as a person. That's just not, I didn't feel emotionally motivated to go into this field. I didn't feel like it would really use my skills and my values. Well, it didn't really speak to my values or my skills. Was, was, that something, was that something that was hard for you to come by? Like, did it take you a while to realize like, oh, this actually isn't my dream. This isn't actually what I want. This is kind of something that I only want because of these outside influences. Did it take you a while to come to that conclusion? Well, that essay was the culmination, I would say, kind of as I was trying to write that essay and as I was thinking about it, because I never really thought about it. I just thought, well, well, this is something that I should do, so I should just go ahead. And that's the way that the authority bias, one of these cognitive biases that I talk about in the book, Never Go With Your Gut, feels like, hey, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. 
these are all the people around me who are telling me that to do this stuff. You know, the conformity bias, same thing. I'm conforming to what other people around me who I respect are telling me to do. Therefore, I'm doing the right thing. And you don't stop and think about, well, what's actually, what do I want to do? Regardless of those people who are in authority, regardless of the people who are in my tribe, who are around me, what do I want to do? And so that essay actually gave me a time to think through this question yeah. in a pretty deep way. And that that was a kind of a, a very challenging moment. I called my girlfriend, a longtime girlfriend, who's now my wife, kind of talked this through, so got an external perspective. Um, one of the one of the techniques for addressing cognitive biases that I talk in the book is getting that external perspective and considering the long-term future. So two things, considering the long-term future, I was thinking about the long-term future. What would be my experience, the long-term future experience as a medical doctor? I didn't know about these techniques, but I was already, the techniques that I didn't yet know about, I sort of used some of them. I sort of used some of the strategies, some of the behaviors that are similar to the techniques, and they really helped me make a good decision to not pursue the medical career because that would not have been good for me in the long term, even though it would have made the people around me happy. Right. So that's what I decided to, that's when I decided to switch to studying the history of behavioral science, okay. which is how people made decisions in groups individually and in groups in historical and contemporary settings. And that's when I eventually got my PhD in that topic. So became okay. professor, doctor. Mm -hmm. So you were a senior at NYU when you were writing the, that essay? Exactly. Okay. And then you graduated and then you got a, a master's at Harvard, correct? That's right. Did you get your master's in behavioral science? I got my master's uh, in sort of a traditional kind of, they, they had a program that was, um, what do I say this? That looked, I, I looked at behavioral science, but within a regional political context. So I was looking more at political decision making, institutional decision making within Russia, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, within that area of the world. Then I went for my PhD at the University of Chapel Hill. And so that's when I focused more on behavioral science itself yeah. kind of, and uh, how do people make be decisions in various historical and contemporary settings. Right. Looking at both. At that point, I started looking. So I was looking at economics and politics in the Russia and so on, that part of the world. Then I switched to comparing of Russia, the Soviet Union, to the United States, just to get that external perspective on the United States, not to just stay within my own cultural context, because having that in, having that outside view is incredibly helpful to understand where you are and what is actually happening, because people are the same everywhere. So if you actually want to see what makes people tick, what causes them to make their decisions, you want to compare people from another culture to people from to people in your culture so you get the differences between what is cult culturally particular you know culturally unique to your culture and the types of decision making you know, american culture for example is very individualistic compared to let's say russian culture so you can see what kind of things cause you to make your decisions based on this cultural context versus what are just the w things that cause us to make decisions based on how our brain is wired yeah you know, are the same around the world. Gotcha, gotcha. And so is that kind of when you realized where exactly you wanted to take your studies? Like in terms of like being able to see the similarities across different cultures? Like did you be, were you able to like point out in your head like here are some of the similarities and now I can kind of like narrow in what my focus is because like behavioral sciences and that kind of stuff can be re relatively broad and you, there's so many different areas you can take it. So when did you kind of decide how you wanted to narrow your focus? So the, uh, how a PhD goes is that the first part of the PhD involves taking a number of classes. So learning about what other people wrote about, what other people talked about. So that was just learning education. Now the later part of a PhD program, so how you become a doctor, you know, PhD, is that you focus specifically on a project of your own. You write a book. Right. So what would first you write a dissertation and then hopefully you publish it as a book, which I did. And so that's when I picked the target area where I was really looking at people's emotions, people's goals, people's decisions, how they made their decisions in a variety of historical and contemporary settings. 
So it was in the later part of my PhD degree. Okay, gotcha. So I kind of, I'm now going to start jumping into the book a little bit. And I want to start off basically in the beginning where you talk about the gut or the head. And so mm-hmm. I want you to break down the difference between the autopilot system and the intentional system. Um, just in a couple quick minutes, kind of talk about the difference and maybe like how we can start not letting the autopilot system take over us. So the old model that many folks are familiar with is Freud's you know, id, ego, and superego, where the id is kind of the completely inaccessible to us. It's the animal, whatever, self. The e- superego is the super, super logical part of ourselves, and the ego is the what, what we have every day. And that model is has been shown to be incorrect by recent research. The Actually, how our brain works in kind of very rough terms is that we have two systems of thinking. One is the older system of thinking. It evolved. It's kind of the same system that we share with monkeys and so on. It's the system of thinking that is emotionally based. It is the mental system that is emotions that drives us forward. We don't notice it when we're using it. It's called the autopilot system. It's habitual. It's instinctive. It's fast. So when you're do, having this fight or flight response, for example, the autopilot system has been evolved to help us survive in the ancient savanna environment. And same thing as, like I said, that we share with the monkeys and so on. When we were hunters and foragers living in tiny tribes, and we had to effectively you know, get away from saber-toothed tigers, which is why the fight or flight response is often called the saber-toothed tiger response. Our ancestors jumped at a hundred shadows in order to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger or to get away from, uh, or to fight an invading tribal member. So that's the fight or flight response. Then another really important aspect of it is tribalism, where we tend to be very tribally oriented. We tend to, as I talked about with the horns effect, when we perceive that somebody is different from us, that means that to our gut reactions, our intuitions, our autopilot system, that person is from a separate tribe. And that we intuitively tend to dislike other people who are not part of our tribe unless we train ourselves not to have that this intuitive, natural, primitive, savage dislike. Another aspect of the kind of tribalism is our desire to climb to the top of the tribal hierarchy and to be at the very top. Our ancestors, the ones who, well, from whom we descended, are the ones who were very successful at climbing to the top of the tribal hierarchy and reproducing, spreading their genes, staying as part of the tribe and fleeing from saber-toothed tigers uh, and defending themselves from attacking tribal members. So those are just some of the ingredients that go into the autopilot system. And those are that cause us to have a number of big, big problematic errors here in the modern world because we have many less saber-toothed tigers right now right. than we did. And we live in a much more complex, multipolar, multicultural, global society rather than, you know, 15 to 150 tribal members around us, which causes us to make terrible decisions when we interact with other people who are not like us. So making really bad estimates of who is trustworthy and who is not. So the autopilot system, it's very important and it's it's not a bad thing, just to be very clear, it's not a bad thing. You know, you don't want to be thinking about every aspect of what you do, right? Every aspect of what you're saying. It's very helpful to to help ourselves just go forward and exist in life, but it causes us to make a number of errors, dangerous judgment errors. So most of the cognitive biases come from the autopilot system. Now, the other system that we have is much more recently evolved. It's the autopilot system is more associated with the amygdala, the older part of the mind. The other part is really more what makes us human. It's what differentiates us from the monkeys. It's the logical reasoning system. It's called the intentional system, also called system one. Uh, I'm sorry, system two. The other one is called system one in the academic literature. And it's a very not intuitive name. So I much prefer the autopilot system yeah. than the intentional system. So the intentional system, it is the one that is much slower. It's much harder to use. It takes effort. It takes willpower. So when you feel yourself trying to restrain yourself from taking that third chocolate chip cookie, that is the intentional system 
trying to restrain, trying to change and steer in the right direction your autopilot system. So the intentional system is the system that we use for more abstract logical reasoning when we can determine what our long-term goals are. And the autopilot system is not long-term oriented, it's very in the moment. The intentional system is long-term oriented. The intentional system is the system that allows us also to understand what other people are like. The autopilot system doesn't do that, it's just reactive. The intentional system helps us look at other people and take ourselves from our heads and put ourselves into their shoes. So it really helped us survive in this modern and in, in the environment where we grew into more complex civilizations, that is the system that helped us manage these complex civilizational dyna dynamics. And so the intentional system can catch autopilot system errors. So most, the large majority of these dangerous judgment errors come from the autopilot system, the evolutionary background, how our brain is wired. A few of them come from the intentional system. We can talk about that. But the intentional system is very useful for catching when the autopilot system is making mistakes, is leading us in the wrong direction, and retraining it. So it's essentially what you're doing is changing a mental habit, an autopilot system mental habit that is problematic for you into a healthy one. And you've done that. You, you've done that your whole life. You just don't know that you've done it. So as babies, you ate with your hands, and so did our primitive savage ancestors. You learned the civilized way of being, of eating with your fork and knife. You know, your <clears> parents <throat> taught that to you. So you changed, you got that new mental habit. And so that's a way that you develop your mental habit. You know, you might have developed a mental habit, like I mentioned, of not taking the third chocolate chip cookie, even though it's hard. <laughs> so that's a healthy mental habit. You might have, you know, it's very intuitive uh, and pleasant to just sit on the couch all day and watch Netflix. That's more autopilot. Now, the harder thing is to put on your sweats and go to the gym. Yeah. That is the intentional system. So you've learned that for your health, for your physical health, you need to do that. Unfortunately, we haven't learned that for our mental health, for our mental fitness, mental fitness is just as important, if not more so in some ways, than physical fitness. But we have not learned how to make good decisions. We have not learned how to retrain our mental habits from the bad decisions that we tend to make because of the autopilot system. Nobody taught us how to make good decisions to having the healthy mental habits, the civilized decision-making processes that you actually need to thrive and succeed in the modern world and avoid decision disasters. Right. And so... <clears throat> I guess in an effort to simplify, I feel like your book is basically, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like your book is basically an effort to help guide people into making sure they're using their intentional system as much as possible so that their autopilot system does not grab hold of them and makes bad decisions, right? It's close to that. Okay. What my book is trying to do is trying to change their autopilot system into using the intentional system and then leave the autopilot system alone. You know, right now, you don't need any intentional system effort to, to eat with your fork and knife, right? Right. <laughs> You're doing that. You know, when you learned how to drive a car, it was hard. It was hard to learn. I mean, looking over your shoulder when you're changing lanes, that's so not intuitive. I mean, I had to, I mean, I failed my first driving test because I couldn't really effectively look over my shoulder when I was changing lanes. So that was bad. So that was something that I had to learn how to do. And that's a very hard thing, mm. learning to drive. But now I do it. It will be hard for me to not do that. Right. It will be hard for me to not look over my shoulder when I'm changing lanes. So my book is to help you make sure that you develop the men, the equivalent in decision making of looking over your shoulder as right. you change lanes and develop that as a mental habit and then you want to leave your autopilot system alone so let it go and do its thing once it's retrained to have the right mental habits so okay. that is my goal my goal is to help you use your intentional system to train your autopilot system away from some of the primitive, savage, bad decision-making habits that we all have as human beings into the civilized ones that we need to succeed and thrive in the modern, multicultural, global, disrupted, whatever society that is so unlike our savage, primitive environment of for which our gut reactions are adapted to. And then have your autopilot system go forward and keep making the using the healthy mental habits to make good decisions. Right. And so basically, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
it seems to me like your 12 techniques to address judgment errors, you basically want people to be able to practice those and implement those so that becomes essentially their autopilot system. Exactly. That's okay. exactly right. So okay, got gotcha. you. Yep, you want to integrate those, and those are pretty simple things. So, yeah, and, see, and I, and I want, I want to, I want to, I'm going to stop you just real quick because I, that's kind of what I wanted to get into because I think a lot of those twelve are things that are easy said but hard to actually implement. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like one of them is mm-hmm. delayed decision making, and I think mm-hmm. so many of us kind of like hear that every so often to like don't respond right or don't react right away. Like take a second to sit back and gather information and then respond after processing some things. So how can, what, what are, what are maybe like one or two of these 12 that are maybe easiest to start implementing? I'll just keep it there. Sure. Uh, Well, let's talk about the delaying decision-making. I mean, that's something that is actually not that hard to do considering that that's something your mom probably told you to do you know, right. count to 10 before you react or something like that and we have some folk the folk wisdom of going with your gut is horrible terrible terrible so that is very very bad you should not go with your gut you should not be authentic you should not you know do what's natural for you that is very bad because it causes you to make bad errors some folk wisdom like that you know count to 10 before you uh, respond that's very helpful. So delaying decision making, I talk about that in the book. This is what's good. This is what's not. You know, just like right now, we're discovering that uh, there's a, a bunch of stuff that were Eastern medicine, whatever that sort of medicine that is completely not helpful. You know, poisonous, toxic. You know, you shouldn't use leeches. You shouldn't use mercury to <laughs> try to cure yourself. But some of the stuff is actually helpful. So I talk about that one of these techniques in the in the book mindfulness meditation. That is something that's actually helpful and proved by recent research to help you. And that is one of the techniques that you can easily implement that you've probably heard other people telling you to do so. That's another thing that's helpful and aligns with traditional advice. Why that's helpful is that it helps you build up your focus. And your focus is what you need to notice when your autopilot system is steering you in the wrong direction and steer yourself back in the right direction. So the delaying decision-making, mindfulness meditation, those are things you've heard. Now, other things that you might not have heard that are not too hard to implement as part of a decision-making process is considering past experience. Consider your past experience with a decision, with a task, with a project as part of making a new de- uh, a new decision. For example, uh, so here's a, here's a very common cognitive bias called the planning fallacy. We like ourselves. We think we're good. We like our gut reactions. Uh, it's very, they're very comfortable to us. They're very intuitive to us. And so when we make plans, we think everything will go according to plan. That is a big problem called the planning fallacy because often our plans actually don't go according to plan and we screw things up. So there was an interesting study comparing students who were asked what would happen, who, who are, had a term paper due, and said, uh, and they were asked, how long do you think it would take you to, half of the class was asked, how long do you think it would take you to complete your term paper if everything went perfectly? Absolutely no problems, everything is great. They answered five weeks. Another group of students, the other half of the class, was asked, how long do you think it will take you to complete your term paper? And they answered, five weeks. <laughs> so. Wow. This is exactly the same. We don't tend to think about all the problems that will come up intuitively. We don't. So what you want to do is consider your past experience before going forward in a project. Now, when those same students were asked, how long did it take you to complete your term papers? I first think about how long it took you to complete your term papers in the past and then answer how long it took you to complete their term papers. Then their answers went to something like seven and a half weeks. <laughs> wow. So this is a very easy, very simple fix for a whole number of problems that come from us being overconfident and making plans that are going, we're going to screw ourselves by making these plans. You know, so many people are leave for a meeting that's 15 minutes away, 15 minutes in advance. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so it's, so it's not necessarily don't make plans. It's just about thinking about the realizing that your plan is plan isn't going to go 100 percent success successfully yes. it's about trying to plan for contingencies about how you can make pivots and make adjustments 
Yes. During the process. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So that's what you need to do. You want to make sure that you are, that you build in contingencies, risks, and problems. So don't think that you know. There's a famous saying: "Failing to plan is planning to fail." That's a bad saying because we tend to make plans that are uh, that we think are perfect, that are actually perfect. You know, we think that we'll complete the term paper in five weeks when we actually won't. I mean, I have climbed classical example. I have a client in Pittsburgh who of what they that's a heavy manufacturing company. So I do consulting, coaching, training for leaders. And they were they typically bid on projects. So it, it was regularly the case that you know they would bid on a project two million, it would take them three million. They would bid five million, it would take them seven million. And that was because they were too optimistic and confident about their ability to complete the project. So sometimes, I mean, they made much less money than they should have, and sometimes they actually lost money on projects. So it was a pretty simple fix, actually, be- to address this problem. It The way that the project the problem was addressed was that the people who were bidding on the project were asked to al- always incorporate their past experience with the same type of project into the new bid. And then their bids were much closer to reality. <laughs> So it's not yeah. a hard fix, and it's something that you can all easily apply. So that's one easy fix that you can do. Now, that's one easy fix for uh, dealing with projects. Yeah. Another easy fix for dealing with people is making sure to get an outside view, consider other people's perspectives. So this is make sure that when you run, when you do projects, Try to imagine what would be something that someone who is a trust and objective advisor would tell you about this question. So what would this person tell you about this project? What would they tell you about your relationship with somebody else? That's a very helpful technique because you take yourself outside of yourself. You take yourself outside of your head, you know, and you see what would the situation look like from the outside? You know, you don't, you're not in here, you're kind of out here. You're looking from the outside in and seeing what's going to happen. What is the situation? And that really helps you address a number of problems that you don't see just if you look, if you're looking straight ahead. You get about 50% of the benefit, according to the research, of this question just by asking it and by thinking about it. Now, you can get the other 50% of the benefit by actually talking to, to a trusted and objective advisor. So that's and the other 50% of the benefit. You know, Give this person a call or you know, if you're a millennial, text this person, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. So I want to bring up something in Chapter 3 because I think it's um, very much like a, a problem that you bring up in the book and in business, but I think it's just kind of like a human problem, which, are, which a lot of these things are. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read out what it says and what a quote says in your book, our immediate gut reaction attributes the behavior of other people to their personality and not to the situation in which the behavior occurs. So I think that a lot of people probably realize that uh, for, for a lot of things, they probably realize that they shouldn't attribute the behavior of somebody else to that individual, their identity, who they are as a person. They realize that they're probably, they could be going through something. But why is it so hard for us to take a step back and actually do that and actually have a delayed response or have a, have the time to take that step back and think about maybe that person actually had something else going on? Hmm. It's because we tend to think of other people as different from ourselves. We tend to think of other people from a from an uncharitable, hostile perspective, that's the intuitive thing for us. If we see somebody, you know, yelling at a soda machine, we tend to think that, you know, that person's a jerk. Why would they be yelling at the soda machine? And we don't think about, you know, maybe the soda machine just stayed there, you know, $3 or whatnot, or something like that. We don't tend to think about what is going on. Maybe they had a terrible day and, you know, just wanted to relieve themselves by getting some soda or something like that we tend to think of other people from their behavior and from an gut, from a gut reaction intuitive perspective that's not a bad thing from the savannah environment yeah. in the savannah environment you wanted to very quickly assess the situation and it was fine to jump to bad conclusions because you could at least protect yourself so it was important for us to protect ourselves and to see other people from a more hostile perspective 
than the right. reality was. Because, you know, if we were too generous toward people, we would die. <laughs> so it was better for us to be more hostile toward people whether than the situation called for. So in the current environment, we have the same thing. We are more hostile toward people. We attribute to them. This is called the fundamental attribution error, by the way. We look at people and we attribute this, what we see to their personality. We make very quick judgments and we make judgments that are way too deep. Our first judgment about a person is going to be very sticky. We are going to be very, have very strong confidence, way too strong confidence compared to the situation about what that person is like from the first glance of the person because it was important in the savannah to do so. Now, it's much, you know, we have much less risk in the current environment. Right. And it's much better to gather more information about a person and judge that person based on a number of pieces of evidence rather than see the first thing and then be anchored to it. But unfortunately, that's not how our minds work. Yeah. So a really helpful technique to address the fundamental attribution error is to think about, hey, how would I feel about the situation if I was the one doing it? Right. So think, put yourself into that person's shoes and think about what could be the context. What could be a charitable way of explaining the situation? Go against your intuitions. This is a lot of the book. This is one of those many ways where you want to get an external perspective and try to put yourself in the other person's shoes to see what might be going on. And this is one of those healthy mental habits that you need to develop yeah. because you're going to make a lot of bad mistakes about people in personal life and in business and in all sorts of areas if you jump to conclusions too quickly. Yeah, I got you. So is there, you talk about a lot of different forms of bias in this book. Is there a current bias that maybe you have that you are currently trying to work on to overcome that's like the biggest struggle for you to overcome? The biggest struggle for me is the optimism bias. So I tend to be motivated. I tend to think everything is good. I tend to think that the risks are smaller than they are. I tend to have exaggerated expectations about other people. Yeah. I tend to think that the grass is green on the other side of the hill, but unfortunately too often it's yellow. So I run into serious problems because I am too optimistic about the future. And so projects that I take on, I have too high expectations of them. And like I said, too high expectations of my collaborators, people with whom I work. I think things will be successful where they're not going to be nearly as successful as they think they are. So this is a serious problem for me. And this is something that I discovered. I mean, I always was optimistic, too optimistic, but I didn't really discover that I was too optimistic until I started learning about these cognitive biases. I'm like, oh, this is why I'm screwing up so often. <laughs> this so, is why I'm failing. You know, I don't, because previously I didn't place guards on my optimism. Yeah. So, but do you feel like, but do you feel like your optimism has served you more than it's hurt you up to this point in your life and career? Hmm. That's really hard to say. So, because I've done uh, adjustments for my optimism, what I like being optimistic in terms of it lifting my mood, helping me be more cheery, but that doesn't have anything to do with what the reality is externally. So, I had to once I learned that this is a problem for me, I started applying the techniques of debiasing. And th this is uh, the technical term for how you fight cognitive biases. Right. 12 techniques are debiasing techniques. You address these biases. And there are only 12 techniques, so it's not like, you know, you don't do, it's not rocket science. Right. You have to, integrating these 12 mental habits, you know, just like brushing, learning to brush your teeth every morning. You, now you can do it, right? <laughs> or you know, eating with your fork and knife, right. looking over your shoulder. So what I had to learn how to do was two things. One is for everyday decisions, for things that you know, I'm going forward and trying to make a decision to decrease my optimism, to calibrate myself, to learn using one of the techniques that we didn't get to uh, talking about called probabilistic thinking, but it's a very important technique. It takes a little bit more explaining because what you basically do is you don't have a binary vision of the world of yes and no, which optimism bias very much says yes. <laughs> you have a probabilistic vision of the world. How likely is something to occur? And so having that probabilistic estimate of the world, you know, 80% likely, 60% likely, 40% likely, helps me then calibrate myself. You know, I am 
I often am 30 to 50% optimistic. So I need to decrease my optimism by that amount. And so you, everyone, you know, everyone listening to this, watching this has certain biases that are particular to them and that cause them to go in the wrong direction. They need to learn what they are and how to calibrate for them. So one is calibrating in everyday decisions for these things. Now for more major things, for more yeah. serious ones, I make sure to run mm -hmm. my ideas, my notions, my projects by someone who is pessimistic, someone who has the opposite bias. So someone who tends to think the who or who thinks the grass is yellow on the other side from the start. Right. <laughs> and I get their perspective on the situation. I don't necessarily take and fully run with their perspective, but getting that outside external perspective from someone who's I trust and who's objective really helps me recalibrate my own cognitive biases for okay. the optimism bias in particular to be more accurate. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so it sounds like you need to be you you use certain levels of your techniques depending on how serious the decision is that you're going to make in terms of like how optimistic you should be and how much you should evaluate the pessimistic side. Um, exactly. So I think something that was super that I resonated with a lot in this um, in your book was that was this idea of hyperbolic discounting. Hmm. And basically, it, you state that we often exchange higher long term gains for smaller short term ones. And I think that basically is kind of the same thing as self-discipline. So I re recently heard the definition of self-discipline read out by somebody as the willingness and the ability to sacrifice what you want now for what you want more in the future. Mm -hmm. And so that I kind of related the two. Um, and because I think that we do that and people do that in business, like you state a number of examples of that in your book, but we do that every single day, right? Because people eat that sweet knowing it's going to, you know, hurt them in the long run, but they get that short term gain, that short term, um, feeling of satisfaction right away. So basically what I'm, what I'm getting at is how do we start to be okay with short term sacrifices? So we need to, the, you've heard of self-discipline, you've heard of these things, you have learned that this is something good, but it's really hard to do, right? Right. When you understand that hyperbolic discounting is going on, that really helps. So the very principle of the matter, understanding what's going on really helps. What you're understanding, because what self-discipline usually feels like is the world against me. It's saying that, hey, I want this suite. It's great. It's awesome. But, you know, stupid world is telling me that I will have, I, I will gain weight and it will be bad for me in the long run. Right. And screw them. <laughs> so that's what it usually feels like. What you need to understand is you're having two different parts of your mind fighting each other. And you're having that autopilot system response, the emotional primitive savage response, fighting the more intentional, logical reasoning side of your mind. And so this is just what's going on. And sometimes when you're not trained in this, when you haven't trained your autopilot system, it's going to win. And that it's a very important to accept that and not to beat yourself up and say, I'm a terrible person because I ate that sweet or because I took another action that sacrificed the, the long term for the short term. What you want to do is approach this question as you would any habit change question. This is, you have a habit. We all have a habit, all of us as human beings. This is true of everyone. We have a habit of sacrificing sm smaller or uh, sacrificing bigger long-term gains for shorter, long, for shorter profit in the short run, for pleasure, profit, whatever. You know? So this is something that we all experience and you're part of the human experience. So what you want to do is just as other people have improved themselves to change that mental habit, you want to change that mental habit and realize that it's going to be a process, it's going to take a long time to yeah. integrate this new mental habit of actually committing, making a commitment to long-term gains over short-term ones, high, bigger long-term gains over short-term ones. So this is where you need to have that mindset that what you're doing is you're developing a habit and it's going to take a while. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to retrain your autopilot system. But once you retrain it, just like now you have a habit of brushing your teeth or eating with your fork and knife, looking over your shoulder, you know, 
whatever habits you've developed that are healthy and beneficial for you, you had to develop them the same way that you develop the habit of addressing the cognitive bias of hyperbolic discounting. So having that idea that it's a habit and that, the, that what you're going to do is develop a new mental habit is incredibly helpful for addressing this problem in the long term. So if we develop the intentional system for kind of the different areas of our life, so let me try to break this down as much as I can. So if we get to be very aware of this idea of hyperbolic discounting in terms of not eating the sweet and we're like, okay, we need to sacrifice this sweet now because it's going to hurt us in the long run. And if we, it'll benefit us in the long run if we don't do this. If we get good at it in our diet, in our eating, does that part of our brain transfer over to being good at it in other areas of our life or like help us in other areas of our life do it? Or is it kind of like a, you know, case by case basis in the sense like I have to do it in my diet, I have to do it in my job, I have to do it in my relationships and that sort of thing. What you're talking about here is domain specificity versus domain generality. And the crucial thing in to make a domain general is to understand that what you're doing is part of a broader principle. If you just have the mindset that I will not eat the sweet uh, now and you don't connect it to a broader principle, which is right. what it is for you, then you're not really, it's not going to help you in other areas of your life. Sorry. It's going to help you develop your willpower in a certain area of your life, but it's not going to help you in others because your brain is not used, to, it, it's not thinking that what you're doing is developing, is fighting this hyperbolic discounting and developing the mental principle of sacrificing smaller short-term gains for larger long-term ones. But if what you're doing, if you have a different mindset, and it's all about mindsets because it's the mental habit. So this is all about how we think about things. If you have the mental habit that, hey, you know, in my diet area, I will avoid sweets or yeah. whatever. I will not take the third chocolate chip cookie. You know, the second one is A-OK. Yeah. third one is not uh, for the sake of my long-term health. In my job, I will not uh, take uh, – I will value – building relationship for the relationships for the long term as opposed to trying to take short term gains and it's very easy i'm sure all of you in your job can imagine how hard it is to build long term relationships to give value versus trying to take advantage of these relationships now and you know not really develop the value of the relationship in the long term that's a classical example or uh, same thing you could go with a number number of examples yeah. you know you will Develop your prof yourself professionally in the long term. That's very good. But in the short term, it's not going to help you as much. So in all areas of your life, as long as you're connected to that broader mental principle, you are going to be much better off. And it's going to transfer across domains. Yeah. So that, that's, that's definitely the answer to the – or that's definitely what I was going for. If you are intentional about doing – if you're doing the if – you, if you're sacrificing – the short-term gain for the long-term benefit and you see it as that, then yes, it can transfer to other areas of life if you keep that mindset. So we're get, getting a little bit lower on time. So I've, I have a few questions left. So in your book, there are a lot of exercises, right? That people can take action on and do. And a lot of books are starting to have more and more exercises and things that you can take action on. But as you know, people are going to read that book and people won't do the exercises. There will be plenty of people who don't do the exercises. My question is why? People are intuitively lazy. The autopilot system is intuitively lazy, and they don't realize the benefits of doing the exercise. They're like, oh, well, I'll read this book. Okay, cool. This sounds interesting. Blah, blah, blah. Let me read the next one. They don't realize how incredibly, incredibly important it is to actually do the exercises to make sure that, they, that these ideas stick in their mind. What you're doing is you're... It's essentially like looking at a weight training video or kind of a gym video and not actually doing the exercises. Yeah. Like, okay, this is interesting. I, I guess in principle I can do this, you know, mental I can do this fitness, physical fitness stuff, and it looks like interesting information for me to keep in mind. You know, let me now watch some lol cats. <laughs> yeah. But this is the same sort of thing in physical fitness. If you actually if you Mental fitness is the same thing. If you read the book and you're just passively consuming it as like interesting information, maybe I'll keep it in mind sometime versus doing the exercise 
seeing we actually have extensive research on this. I mean, I'm not you know pulling this out of a certain part of my body. Yeah. <laughs> of research on showing that if you only read and learn about cognitive biases, you will not get much benefit from doing so. Because you have what you need to do is you need to identify where in your life they're hurting you in particular, and how you can make a plan to address them to prevent the situation from happening in the future. Because what you're doing when you're reading it is you're using your intentional system. And your intentional system is not really going to change your autopilot system without you identifying the emotions behind it. You need to arouse in yourself emotions around the cognitive biases, each of the cognitive biases. You need to identify where they're hurting you. And that is the emotion that will cause you to change because we want to move away from a source of pain. So the autopilot system, in order to actually get it to change, to change your mental habits, you need to identify the pain points for each of these cognitive biases and then make a plan for moving away. Because, you know, like a doc- if a doctor just tells you you're fat, you need to lose weight, that you will feel bad, <laughs> but you, you, will not, you will most likely not do anything about it. You know, maybe you'll go home and be so sad you'll eat more ice cream, right? Yeah. <laughs> not that it happened to me. Um, right. <laughs> so you need to identify the pain points for each of these cognitive biases and then make a specific plan for you know, the workout, the physical fitness for losing weight or the mental fitness in this case for addressing each of these cognitive biases going forward. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So I think that one of the important things to getting closer to the best version of yourself is kind of visualizing what that person could potentially be capable of or what that person could look like and then trying to figure out how to get closer to that person. So I want you to to visualize the best version of yourself right now. All, he has all the skills that you'd ever want to have, has all the knowledge that you'd ever want to have. Mm-hmm. What, and I'll st- stick with those two things, what skill for what name one skill or piece of knowledge that that person has that you don't currently have i'd say good storytelling that's been a area of weakness for me for a long time i'm much more of a logic and reason and argumentation person and it's very not intuitive for me to tell stories but i've learned over time that telling stories is much more what resonates with people. So because I am very passionate, I mean, my values are utilitarian, which means I want the most good for the most number. And I'm in this area because I want people to stop hurting and stop suffering from the bad decisions that they're making. And I've learned that in order to do that, I need to tell better stories. So that's the main thing I'm working on actually right now, how to tell better stories and how to convey my message more effectively, more charismatically, more emotionally. So that is the big area of skill. That is the big skill that I would like to, you know, wave my magic wand and develop. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I love that. Yeah, I think that's, I'm, I love that you said that. I think that is super important for anybody, especially as a speaker and as an author and stuff like that. Um, and it's very, I acknowledge you for being, uh, ex- displaying the humility enough to be able to, to be able to say that. So I think that's awesome. Um, so before I ask the last questions, I do want, I do want to acknowledge you because I think so much of what you do now is probably be probably because of you moving from Moldova at 10 years old and yes. probably kind of experiencing a lot of these maybe biases yourself as an immigrant and stuff like that. Um, and then just kind of through your own realization of, you know, I was going to go down this medical path, but I realized that I had all of these biases from other people and stuff like that. And I just think that Everything that happened to you is how you got to where you are today. Um, You're absolutely think- right, Nick. Uh, it definitely is. I mean, that's my life journey. I wouldn't have been here and I would not have been motivated to do what I'm doing if I hadn't seen the alternative paths that my life could have could have gone on right. if I didn't make better choices. <laughs> and I mean, I could have, you know, it would have been nice to make better choices as a kid. I wish I had learned this in school and not wasted so much of my life pursuing a medical degree and you know other areas so yeah right definitely the case yeah well and kind of the kind of the point is and i think you know this as well is that 
the time wasn't wasted. It had to ha- it had to happen the way it happened for you to be able to get gain all the knowledge and have all the experiences that you had to be able to serve people in the best way possible mm-hmm. now moving forward. Um, well, I want to make sure everybody goes and gets this book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. Um, and then where do you hang out most on social media and uh, what your website is, do, um, disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Um, mm-hmm. And then where, where else can people support you and everything like that? So folks can go, like Nick mentioned, on disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Check out my videos, blogs, podcasts, consulting, coaching, training, manuals, and so on. There's a free online course of eight modules with the critical information on making the best decisions called the Wise Decision Maker guy called the Wise Decision Maker course on disasteravoidanceexperts.com slash subscribe. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com slash subscribe, free eight module video course. I am very active on LinkedIn, so connect with me there. Dr. Gleb, G-L-E-B, Sipursky, T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y, and follow me on Twitter at Gleb underscore Tsipursky. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Well, very good. Well, the last question that I want to ask you is I think that becoming the best version of yourself is a constant journey and I think it's a unique journey. I think the way that I'm going to become the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you become the best version of yourself. So what I want to ask for you personally is if you could currently do or work on three things to get closer to that best version of yourself, what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? So one of those things I mentioned is storytelling. I'm definitely working on that and want to work more on that. Another thing I want to work on more is work-life balance. Actually, that's always something I've struggled with. I tend to be very passionate about what I do, and it's very easy for me to come to the stage of burning out. So I'm trying to focus much more on work-life balance and figuring out how to do that effectively. So that's another area of myself that I'm working on. And a third area is actually, I mentioned, you know, I, I talk about physical fitness and that's something that I always struggle with. So, you know, as a kid, I was very overweight. Uh, you know, I think I reached something, gosh, 260 pounds in one point in my life and yeah. I'm oh 205 my. right now. So that is a constant struggle for me and that I, always trying to figure out what's a better routine, physical exercise routine. I do about 45 minutes of exercise a day and what's the best diet for me. And it evolves, of course, as I grow older, you know, I'm 38 right now and I'm sure it'll be different when I'm, you know, 45 or something like that. So that's something I'm working on. Okay. Awesome. Well, those are three great things. Well, that's all we got today. Dr. Sapersky, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Nick. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you inviting me on.